at his job this morning working. Praise the Lord. So I know what he's doing. He's he's going to come back more on fire because when he when he works and he spends his free time on the Lord, the Lord just keeps pouring out revelation on him and revelation on him. And so I know the Lord's going to use this time with him being there to give him a new word and to give him new strength and new revelation. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, I'm going to start in uh, Acts 19. Uh, the title for today was uh, Faith or Formula, Which One Works? So starting in Acts 19, 1 through 13, it says, While Apollos was in Corinthia, or was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he meets Ephesus, until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he had found several believers. And that word believers there in Greek is Matthias, M-E-T-H-E-T-E-S, which means disciples, the followers of the way. Verse 2 says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't, haven't even heard there was a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Then Paul went to the synagogues and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers, took the disciples with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years so that people throughout all the province, throughout province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs and aprons that, were merely touched, that merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their disease, and evil spirits were expelled. So later, a group of Jews were traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. And this is the where they used the for, they were using the formula that they had seen. They tried using the name of the Lord Jesus in their inca incantation, saying, "I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out." So, see, this group of Jews was probably there when Paul, over the two-year span when Paul was healing and God was doing miracles through him, unusual miracles through him. <clears throat> this group of Jews were probably there witnessing it. They probably saw how he spoke and how the Holy Spirit moved through him them not knowing that the Holy Spirit was moving through him, them just thinking he was saying, in the name of Jesus, come out. So they, had, they were using his formula. And it, as they traveled town to town, it, it worked because they didn't stop just at one town, right? So they went to one town, then they went to another town using this, their incantation, so it, their formula. So it was working to some degree. All right, verse 14. So seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were the ones doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirits replied, I know Jesus, I know Paul, but who are you? So they ran into a spirit that was stronger and more powerful than their formula they were using. Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. So again, they had heard what Paul was doing, or what God was doing through Paul, and they had seen, seen him cast out evil spirits. They had, had success doing it themselves with their, with their formula. Then they ran into one that didn't work. In Ephesians 6, 11 through 17, it says, Put on all of God's armor, so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, 
but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, put on, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith that stops fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And then we're going to talk about the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word in Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes the innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are all accountable. So God's, sharp, God's word is sharper than any two edges, a double-edged sword. But if we're not studying and we're not seeking and we're not in his word, the sword that we are trying to then use is not well defined. It is not well sharpened by God's word. So then we would be like the sons of Sceva when we're standing in just trying to use a formula to stand against the devil. But instead, if we're in the word and we're using God's word to sharpen our spiritual sword and preparing for battle, the way God intended it, not just trying to use the formula where I can just say this, I can just do this. No, we need to get in God's word and use his, use his sword of the spirit. So how sharp is your sword? Romans ten seventeen says, so faith comes from hearing, that is hearing the good news about Christ. So what are you hearing? Are we hearing things that lift us up? Or are we hearing things that tear us down? And then in Luke 8, 43 through 48 is the first part. I'm going to jump all, all around on, this, on Luke 8. But so a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with, a, with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. So in, in this day when they were... In this day, so if, when a woman was having her menstrual time, that she she had, was ceremonial unclean, so she couldn't be out in public. She had to be in her, in her house. She couldn't leave for that time, and then she had to pu ritually purify herself with a bath. So coming up behind Jesus, she had touched the fringe of his robe, and immediately the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, the whole crowd is pressing against you. So in this, so let, let the Holy Spirit show you this picture. So they're pushing through a town, through a square, and there's hundreds of people all pressing in around Jesus. Everybody wanted to just get a glimpse and get a touch, and everybody wanting to just see what's going to happen. And I asked the Lord, I was like, Lord, why is it that not everyone else was healed? Because I'm sure there was other ones there that were, were sick or were injured, or, or needed a miracle, or needed to be touched by God, and needed something. She was the only one that had the faith to be healed. She was the only one that thought, I know who he is, I know what he can do, and I know if I can just touch the hem of his clothes, I can be made whole. Because as you read, she spent everything she had on doctors and physicians, and all the money she had, she had nothing left. She was at her wit's end. She was, and she was tired of what was going on. And we have to get tired of being beat up by the devil and being pressed down by the devil. We have to say enough is enough. I'm going to press into God. I don't care if I have to fight a thousand people to get to him. I'm going to get in and I'm going to touch him. God is, ha, God is my miracle. God has my miracle. God will provide for me. I'm going to do what I have to do to reach God. And he will provide for me. He will heal me. He will deliver me. Verse 46 says, but Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she couldn't stay hidden, she began trembling and fell on her knees in front of him. And that's why she was so afraid, because if the, the church, the Pharisees, would have known that she had been bleeding for 12 years, 
they would have all, she could have been stoned. All they would have had to do was start shouting unclean, unclean, and then a mob would have formed. The church would have come after her. So when the woman realized she couldn't stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell on her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So until faith is released, you can't get your miracle. Then jump up to, excuse me, verse 40 in Luke 8. So on the other side of the lake, the crowds welcome Jesus because they have been waiting to see him, been wanting to see him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his home with him. His only daughter was about 12 years old, was dying. Jesus went with him. He was surrounded, that's when he was surrounded by the crowds. So as he went with Jairus, that's when the crowd surrounded him. And Jesus didn't question Jairus. He immediately followed him because of his faith. Because he said, I know if I can get Jesus to come to my house, my daughter will not die. My daughter will live. And then down to 49, it says, verse 49 and 50 says, while he was sitting there speaking to the woman with the bleeding that had just been healed, a messenger arrived from Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told him, your daughter is dead. There is no use to trouble the teacher now. But when Jesus heard what happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. She will be healed. So the people come up and say that they're dead. This could be anything from doctor coming in and giving you a bad report. This could be anything from the, you know, like you're talking about having tests coming up and the devil coming, this is going to be bad. This is going to be bad. This is going to be bad. What are we listening to? We don't need to listen to the devil and we don't need to listen to the negative because Jesus says, stop fearing and believe. Don't be afraid. She will be healed. And it is in our power to stop fear. And then jump down to verse 51 and 52 in Luke 8. When they arrived at the house, so now they're at Jairus' house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, James, Peter, John, James, and the little girl's father and mother. The house was filled with weeping and wailing, and Jesus said, Stop weeping. She isn't dead, she's only sleeping. So why didn't Jesus let everyone else go inside? Jesus took those who he knew had the faith to see this little girl wake up. I mean, because when, because I mean, let the Holy Spirit show you this. I mean, when they were in the town, the woman with the bleeding had just been healed. Then Jairus' servants come up and say, don't bother him. She's already dead. How many of the followers of the disciples said, oh, she's dead? Man, if he wouldn't have stopped in this crowd... She might have lived. But James, John, and Peter probably said, no, she's not dead. He can bring her back. I've seen him do this. He can do this. So then they come in the house because they have faith. So what is God waiting to show you if we will stop doubting or stop being afraid? What miracles are you right, here, right there on the edge of that God has in store for you if you would only have faith and believe? You have to remove all doubt and fear. We must have faith. And then James 4, 7. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> James 4, 7 says, So humble yourself before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Then Luke 17, 6. Jesus tells us, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, May you be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So, you know, I've always heard when I was younger, I always thought it takes big faith. You've got to have big faith to be able to say this. You have to have big faith to get healed. You have to have big faith to be financially independent or debt-free. You have to have big faith to have a house. You have to have big faith to step out on faith. You have to have big faith to do this. You don't. 
Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, and most of us have seen mustard seeds, they're really, really small, right? I mean, they're about the size of a pinhead, the head of a pin. So it doesn't take us having a lot of faith. It just takes us believing who God says, who, that God says, that God says what he means, it means what he says, and we are who he says we are, and that we can have all that God says we can have. And in Luke 9, 1 and 2, it says, One day Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and heal all diseases. So has Jesus called you? If you're here today, he has called you. You know, his word says, for many you're called, but few are chosen. You can be called to come into his house. You can be called to come back to him. You can be called to have a relationship with him. But few are chosen. That's in Matthew twenty-two fourteen. 14. To be chosen is what God has done for this house and the people in this house. We have been chosen to be used by God in this day to be a light upon the hill, to be a place where God can set up his presence and to have people from all over the south to come into this building to see God's face, to be healed, to have ambulances pulling up with the dead, willing the dead in for God to bring them back to life. And all the prophecies that have been prophesied over this place in the 39 years that it has been here, God has not forgotten. They were not said in vain. So will we hold on to them and will we still believe God is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do? And will we press in to see the things of God? Will we be like the woman that had, had believed for 12 years? And it doesn't matter what it takes. It doesn't matter if I have to get on my hands and knees and crawl or I have to jump over the chairs to get to God. I'm going to get to God. I'm going to get to what God has for me. Amen. 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 Then Luke 8. Back to Luke 8, 52 through 56. So the house was filled with people, so they're back to Jairus' house. So they just got to the house. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing, but he said, but Jesus said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead, she's only sleeping. So the things you've been hoping for, the things you've been believing God for, they're not dead and gone. They're only sleeping. God is here this morning to tell you what he has in store for you is right there. Do not give up. Do not lose hope. Keep pressing into him, and you will have your heart's desire in him. You see, all the people there in the house that were weeping and wailing is like the devil coming laughing and mocking, saying, there, it's over, it's done. You might as well give up now, throw in the towel, and just, hey, you'll go to heaven, that's fine, but you can't have nothing else. You've already, your soul's been saved, but that's all you get. You, you'll get everything else once you get to heaven. No, that's not what God's word says. And the devil's there, hey, you know, it's okay. Everybody was paycheck to paycheck. You know, you, you, that's, that's fine. You'll make it, but hey, you'll, you'll make it. God will get you through it. You'll make it. No, God says he'll supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. In the scripture I read this morning, it says, my cup will overflow, right? A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Will he give unto his people? So are we going to believe the devil that we can barely scrape by? Are we going to believe God that we'll have an abundance? That when we see someone in need, we don't have to decide to obey God and not pay, this, pay a bill or obey God and just do it. Know that God will supply all of our needs, right? And if God lays it on your heart to do something for someone, do it. Don't let the, don't, don't, don't let the devil come in your mind and say, Oh, that's just you. That's not the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to do that. No, you, you need that. You need gas for next week. You you might need it for you might want to go eat later. No, if God moves on you, the Holy Spirit moves on you to, to give to somebody, do it. Because God is preparing you and teaching you how to live in that abundant life. Because by giving and helping others is how God's gonna get you to the abundance. And when your cup overflows, and that's how I said when, earlier when I said that's how you, you, the love of God will show through you. And people can be reached through your giving. And your giving is a form of worship to God. When you give, it is worship in worship to God. It completes your worship. Yeah. 
All right, then verse 54 says, Then Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, My child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned, and she immediately stood up. Then Jesus told, told them to give them something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed, but Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened yet. And that was because this time had not come yet. So it's time we as the children of God, the men and women of the Most High, kings and priests of the Most High, we use our authority that Jesus has given us. I mean, do you want to see a move of God? Do you want to see him move on your behalf? Then show him your faith. It's time we stop begging and start believing that it's already done. Let's see it with spiritual eyes. See it completed. See his prophecies fulfilled. And everything that's been said and prophesied fulfilled. See it in the spirit. Not in the natural, not in the flesh. Because we see it in the spirit, God will then bring it to the natural. And we will see this house filled and overflowing where we have to have two and three services. Where we have to move Saturdays and Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays. And we have services five, six, seven days a week. I don't know what you but I want to see that. Amen. I want to see everything prophesied. I want to see the ambulances pulling up with the dead and then wheeling them in and God raising them up. I want to see that. I want to see to where God sends someone in, pays this building off, and then we immediately begin building on another place because God is sending the people in, and we need the space. I'm done putting the, the handcuffs or bind, hindering God. I want God to move how God wants to move and do all that he wants to do. If he wants to use me for it, great praise of the Lord. I'll do what he will. But if you want somebody else, hey, be used by God to do what God wants. I want to see God save people. I want to see God change this world. I want to see God move and be manifested in a way that the world has never seen. And all we have to do is have the faith the size of a mustard seed. That's all it takes. And be obedient. Then Acts 10, 9 through 20. So it says, so the next day, they were on their journey and approaching the city. Peter went on to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, but while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And he saw heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by four corners upon the earth. It were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to heaven, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So see how many of us have done that. God says, well, Give to this person. Oh, no, Lord, I, but I need it. I might need it. And the voice came again a second time, What God has made common, do not call, or what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times. So, you know, don't get discouraged if, you miss God, or God says to move and you miss it. Don't, get, don't allow the devil to get you under condemnation or discouraged. Just be more willing to learn, be open to learning and allowing the Holy Spirit to teach you because even the disciples missed it. Even the disciples messed up from time to time. I mean, because it says there that it happened three times. So obviously the, the first time it said, he, oh, no, Lord, I can't do that. The second time, no, Lord, I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. And then it happened a third time. So, I mean, just because you missed God the first time, don't, don't get under condemnation. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed, see, even after three times, he was still didn't know what to make of it. As he was perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen meant, behold, there were men who were sent by Cornelius, having inquired from, for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So again, the Holy Spirit says, Stop doubting. He is trying to do something the world has never seen. Just like it was in that time. He was taking the word of God to the Gentiles. And he was teaching Simon Peter that it is okay, whatever God has made clean, 
it is okay for them to eat. Because with the law of Moses, there were certain things they couldn't eat because it was ceremonial unclean. So God was trying to show him everything he is, what everything he has made is what he calls clean is not unclean. Because he was trying to do something the world has never before seen. And that's what's going on right now. The Lord is wanting to do things the world has never seen. So just because something seems a little odd to us, if God tells you to do it and you feel led by the Holy Spirit to do it, do it. Because the world has never seen the things God has in store to do. So obviously it's going to be a, a little different to us, right? It may catch us off guard, right? We may not understand how it works, how, is, how he's going to do it. But it's not up to us to develop the plan. It's not up to us to guarantee the results. It's not up to us to determine the outcome. It is up to us to hear the voice of God and be obedient to the word of the Lord. When God says move, to move. When God says do this, we do it. And leave the results up to him. So again, it's not up to us to figure out how God is going to do it. Then James 5, 13 through 19. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal, heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was a human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, None fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield crops. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, uh, I probably wasn't supposed to put that. Sorry, I put, uh, go back to 18. Put one too many in there, I think. Yeah. All right, so then when he prayed again, the sky... Just go back to 13. Let me read that section over again. Sorry. Y'all bear with me. So are any of you suffering? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a, pray such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you've committed any sins, you will be forgiven. So God wants us to hold him to his word. The Bible is anointed, the, is the word of God. It is holy scripture. God wants, he's, he's not man that he can lie. He wants us to hold him to everything he said in that Bible. So when we're praying, Lord, your word says, I will be healed. Lord, your word says, by Jesus' stripes, I am healed. Pray the word back to God. And then Romans 2.11, it says, for God does not show favoritism. So God is no respecter of persons. So if he's done it for somebody you know, if he's healed someone you know, or he, like you can read in the Bible and see where he's healed someone. God, I know you are no respecter of person. You did this for him, so I know you'll do it for me. God, you healed this person of this disease, and now the devil's attacking me with something similar, but you healed that, so I know you'll heal me of this. Because you, your word says you are no respecter of person. What you did for them, you'll do for me. You know, like I remember this, the Lord reminded me of the story where Brother Tim was talking about where he had the blood transfusion. Jesus was sitting beside him getting the blood transfusion. And I was talking with someone that was, was fighting through cancer or something. I'm like, look, God's no respecter of persons. And I told him, hey, this is kind of what happened with someone I know. He did it for them. He'll do it for you. So look, get with God. Let's pray. Be in the spirit. Visualize Jesus sitting next to you getting a blood transfusion, and you will be healed and you will be redeemed. He did it for Pastor Tim. He'll do it for me, right? He'll do it for you, right? God shows no favoritism. So if you know someone that God has blessed financially, 
God, you did it for them, so you show no favoritism. I know you'll do it for me. Don't, don't get jealous because God did it for somebody else. Praise God with them for them getting blessed, knowing that God shows no favoritism. He did it for them. He'll do it for you. And then Mark 10, 46 through 52, it says, Then they reached Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. If y'all are here Wednesday night, this was one of the scriptures Brother Tim read. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then, you know, so hit, Bartimaeus was like the woman with the bleeding. How bad do you want what God has for you? How bad do you want your healing? How bad do you want your financial blessing? How bad do you want it? So Bartimaeus was tired of being blind. He was tired of being considered the scum of the earth in that day because he was a beggar. Because he was blind, he couldn't work, right? So he only depended on the kindness of others. So when he hears Jesus coming, I'm going to do what I have to do to get to him because he has my eyesight. I'm going to do all that I have to do. And then here comes the church. Hey, be quiet. Be quiet. Stop yelling. Stop shouting. Just sit in the seat. And if he wants to say something to you, he'll say something. Just, shh, just We're trying to listen. We're trying to see. Be quiet. So how many times do we hinder others? Because we don't think what they're doing is the way we would do it or the way that we think it should be done. It's not up to us to determine how stuff is done. It's up to us to be obedient. So if we see somebody shouting out to God, praise God with them. Our Lord, you know what they need, Lord. I just lift them up to you right now, Lord. I'm standing in agreement with them for what they need from you. Give them what they need, God. They need it bad. I can tell how they're, they're screaming and shouting for you. So I'm going to believe with them, God. Where two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst, Lord. So I know you're here with us now. And I'm standing up with them. They are not alone. But instead, the church, the people yelled, be quiet. But he, that made him only shout louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. 49. But Jesus heard him and stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. And come, he's calling for you. See all your screaming work. He had pity. Come on. I don't know why he wouldn't come to me. I, just because I wasn't shouting. I don't know why he comes to this man that's sitting in the ditch shouting. I'm sitting in my seat. I'm, I'm here. I come on Sunday. Why is he doing something for that person? It's because he's screaming and shouting. How bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Are you sick and tired of not having all God said you can have? It's time we stand up and start shouting out to God. It's time we stand up and start putting the devil in his place back under our feet. It's time we go to war with the devil and stop letting him beat us up and beat us down and have his way. He has been defeated over 2,000 years ago. So why do we give, him, why do we give in to him? It's time we as God people stand up and be who God said we are and who God has chosen us to be and who he has called us to be. And then verse 50 says, Bartimaeus threw aside his coat. He jumped and came to Jesus. So now he knows he's got Jesus' attention. Hey, he's going, right? Then Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? My rabbi, the blind man, said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. So the Holy Spirit is here this morning asking, what do you want me to do for you? What do you need that only God can give? What do you want me to do for you? Then John 14, 12 through 14. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works, because I am going to the Father. You can ask anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. 
Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So again, the Holy Spirit is asking you, what do you want me to do for you? So as we play this song, I want everyone to stand to your feet and just whatever you need from God, ask him and he will do it. If you need healing, as the scripture says, come and get prayed for. If you need finances, ask and you will have. And if, it's some, if it comes from some way you don't expect, don't dismiss it. If the Holy Spirit says to do something that you wouldn't expect him to ask you to do, don't dismiss it. The best way to get finances is to give your way out of it. If you need finances, the best thing to do is give. I can't tell you how many times I've been where I needed, I had a bill that was due at this specific time, and I didn't have enough for it. And I come in and feel led that the Lord says, give me what you got. And I'm like, Lord, but I need it. He said, give me what you got. And I would walk up here and open my wallet and just dump everything, like have it all. It's not enough for me. So why am I holding on to it like it's God, right? And then a way, God made a way where there seemed no way, and he came through. So don't just expect God to do it a certain way. Believe that God can do all things, and he will do all things. Amen. Play the song.